Happy Wednesday, football fans, and welcome into another edition of the Pro Football Chase Podcast. I'm Isaac Sines, and I thank you for joining me. In today's episode, NFL defensive tackle Jarrell Worthy and I recap week four and preview Thursday night's clash between the Rams and Seahawks. We also discuss various other topics, including Vontez Burfick's suspension, Gardner Minshew's hot start, and the Falcons' early struggles. Plus, we'll give our game picks for week five. But before we dive into a new episode, let's take a listen to some of the top scoring plays from week four. 20 yards on third and six, in zone, touchdown, Allison again. Certainly a Sanders, it helps him. Here he is, swinging out. Howard will walk in for the touchdown. Good time. And the throw, and he's got him. Roller, touchdown. Fake to him over the middle, and he's caught. That's the rookie, A.J. Brown. He's still going. Brown showing the wheels to the 10 to the 5. And he's in for the touchdown. The interception. Wide open, and into the end zone is Golden Jr. 32, Rosen looking underneath. Up the third, going to the outside. He's got a man wide open. Touchdown, Dolphins. After an 18 yard touchdown pass, it's an end around. It goes off to Trevor Davis with a blocker ahead. He's got Miller, he got a block for Miller, and he's going to take it in for the touchdown. This is the Pro Football Chase Podcast, a podcast that has featured interviews with Rams wide receiver Robert Woods. 32,000 yards. Um... And, you know, last year, unfortunately, I got hurt mid, midway in the season. But other than that, just just working and grinding to, to get to this point. And uh, probably broke it with a lot of games left. Packers wide receiver Marquez valdez Uh Just the fact that we got a, you know, uh, all pro on the other side of the ball. Um, you know, and Devontae. Um, so when you got a guy like that, you know, that's who's going to get the main focus. Um, obviously, you know, people start to know my name a little bit after I made a few plays here and there. Broncos offensive guard Ronald Leary. It would either have to be a counter or uh, a pin and pull play when we get on the edge and run. Uh, I think it's always impressive when big guys can, can get out that stance and move and hit somebody. So. And rising stars Dalton Risner, Charles Amenahu, and Jawan Williams. This is a podcast that offers player perspectives from some well-decorated veterans, including T.J. Hushman Zada. And people will say, oh, well, is that Chris got a franchise quarterback? Uh, look, look at his record, does it? It tells you he is. Oh, he has a great defense. He has Ezekiel Elliott. You tell me a quarterback in the entire NFL that's not Tom Brady that does more with that. Game previews, recaps, and analysis. Turn the volume up. The chase is on, and the chase is live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into the Pro Football Chase Podcast. It's Isaac Signs with you, and joining me yet again is my co-host, Jarrell Worthy. So we're getting ready for week number five already in the NFL season. So things are going really quick already in October. So Jarrell, how you doing this morning? And how excited are you to preview some more football games? Extremely excited this morning. Uh, thank you again for allowing me to be on the show. Um, it's a great opportunity to be able to talk about some football, man. We got some interesting storylines, a lot of good stuff to cover today. So uh, let's get to it, man. All right, sounds like a plan. So this week I want to do something different. So under the radar players of week number four, we typically will give our players of the week. But I feel like there's so many players. And, of course, this makes this exercise a little bit difficult for us, Jarrell, because there's so many players to choose from that have done the dirty work, so to speak, to help their team get a win in week four. So I'll go ahead and get things started here. We'll each pick an offense and defensive player for under the radar and underappreciated players. So mine for offense, I got to go with Chiefs running back Daryl Williams. Daryl Williams, he was an undrafted free agent out of LSU in 2018. He stayed patient, worked hard. He was at the bottom of the depth chart last season. And then, of course, this season, they have Damian Williams. They signed LaShawn McCoy. But Damian Williams has been hurt the last couple of weeks. And 
Darrell Williams' stat line doesn't look all that pretty, Jarrell, when you look at it from Sunday. But what he did do was he scored touchdowns and helped convert a big fourth down. And he capped it off with a one-yard touchdown run. He had two touchdowns. Again, 13 rush yards on eight carries. So no, not the best yards per carry average. But he also came through with three receptions for 43 yards on Sunday. So Darrell Williams is my under-the-radar player on offense. All right, all right. I like your uh, your pick, Isaac, man. Um, I'm going to go with a guy uh, everybody kind of knows uh, but hasn't been getting as much uh, appreciation this year. Um, I would go with Leonard Fournette, um, the first-round pick out of LSU. Um, everybody's been on the Gardner Minshew train. Everybody's uh, had their opinions about the, the play, and it's been spectacular. Um, I mean, he's having some phenomenal moments um, when given his opportunity to shine, and um, he's having this Jaguars team believing that they uh, can substantially make a run at the playoffs. And so, um, you know, obviously there's a there's a great understanding there with their offense, but Leonard Fournette and what he's been able to do over the last few weeks uh, with everything that's been surrounding Gardner Minshew, he said he comes into work. Um, he had over 200 yards rushing last week, um, had a big 80 yard run that helped propel uh, those guys into a, a scoring situation. Uh, with all the hype that's surrounding the guy out of Washington State, man, it's been, um, it's, he, Leonard Fournette hasn't really been talked about as much and, and the consistency he's been playing with this, uh, this year and having the sixth rank uh, rushing offense and, and, and uh, consistently being available week in and week out Un- unlike last year it's been a very uh a steady uh rushing attack for this jaguars offense this year now um, so leonard Fournette is my offensive player um that's under the radar yeah i appreciate that pick a lot because i don't know if you saw that thursday night game jacksonville and tennessee and Fournette was absolutely bottled up he had nowhere to run and leading up to i think five minutes left in the fourth he was averaging like 1.3 yards per carry just because there was nothing there. And, of course, I think he broke away with a 25-yard run. And so it made his stats look a little bit better. I have respect for a guy like that who keeps on working hard. He doesn't complain. He doesn't go to the media. He doesn't throw his offensive line under the bus. He keeps working hard, churning his legs, and comes through with a huge game for the Jaguars, as you mentioned. So I like that pick a lot, and I have a lot of respect for Leonard Fournette. Now, defensive player, Jarrell, I have Bears linebacker Nick Kwiatkowski. I think that's how you say it. Kwiatkowski is a former 2016 fourth-round pick out of West Virginia, and he showed up to play on Sunday in the Windy City against the Minnesota Vikings. And one of the things with him was Roquan Smith, the first-round pick for Chicago, was a surprise and active. And so Kwiatkowski... About 90 minutes before game time, that's when he learned he was going to be filling in as a starting linebacker. He's not the most athletic. He's not the flashiest, but he got the job done. Nine total tackles, eight solo, two tackles for loss, one quarterback hit, one sack, and one forced fumble against Minnesota. So he for sure was under the radar, but he was a big part in Chicago's dominant performance on Sunday. See, Isaac, that's why you're one of uh, the coolest guys on the earth, because we um, each have the same type of mindset, the same type of thinking. Although I'm going to go with the Bears defense, I'm going to go with a different player on the Bears defense. I'm going to go with Nick Williams, the defense alignment out of Sanford. Um, he stepped in for Akeem Hicks, who was injured last week, had the opportunity to uh, ha- to join the those, uh, that vicious defense in the starting role. Um, he was able to have seven total tackles. He had two sacks against the Minnesota Vikings in two crucial situations. And there was an opportunity for him to, to go in there and make some big plays, man. Um, he had two, t- two TFLs, and um, he was able to go out there and uh, position himself to be really, really, um, uh, and, and really substantial in, the, uh, in his opportunity to be in the starting role. Uh, uh, with Nick Williams and what he was able to do, uh, filling in for Akeem Hicks, man. He is my defensive player falling under, uh, flying under the radar. That's a good pick right there, Nick Williams. I did see him quite a bit, causing some disturbances against Minnesota. So now we have that done. Let's go ahead and move to our fact fiction segment, which is something that we debuted last week, Jarrell. So the big topic right now, really all this week, and there's been – and outrage with some NFL players, so I'm going to be interested to see 
how you view it and where you stand on this. But Vontez Burfick, the Raiders linebacker, we know he has a track record. I think he was penalized and fined 13 other times before Sunday's hit on Jack Doyle. Now, if you didn't see it, you can check it out. It's all over social media. Jack Doyle caught a pass over the middle. His knee was down, and Vontez Burfick came and hit him helmet to helmet. That caused the refs to call a personal unsportsmanlike conduct penalty which then had perfect ejected from the game the nfl announced the ruling that he is suspended for the remainder of the season so he is done after that play on sunday so here's the statement and we'll say whether we believe it's fact or fiction so here it is a season-long suspension for vontez perfect is overdone I believe that it is fact um, solely off the basis of the play. I understand that, uh, you know, the history of the tr- and the track record that Vontez Perfect has. Um, I believe that, you know, if you're going to suspend a guy in that situation, um, you know, obviously because of his previous track record, eight to ten games would have been suffice. But when I look at the nature of the play, uh, you have a player going down to the knee um, that has the opportunity to get up and run. After catching the football, um, I have a, a big 6'4 and 250, 60-pound linebacker um, coming in to make a play, uh, as well as a defensive back who's also lowering his head to come in and make a play. Um, and then you have Jack Doyle who's curling himself up, you know, obviously to protect himself. But at, given the proper, given the angle in which he was at, Vontez Breffick has, he, you know, how low can you expect a player to go? Um, I think at the at the end of the day, um, you know, you want to you want to suspend him because of his track record, and obviously you want to suspend him because of the nature and and, the, and not having the respect for the players after the hit. I think you know Vontez Breffick is a tremendous player. I think that at the end of the day. Um, if he was playing in a different era, a lot of his antics and the thing and the way that he plays would be acceptable unto the league. But, you know, obviously times have changed and, you know, the rules of, of the game have changed. And so um, I think that with that opportunity, uh, I think that he needs to become more remorseful. But an eight to 10 game suspension, I think, would have been suffice, suffice um, as opposed to the entire season after only being week four. That's a fact. I think the season long suspension is well overdone. As mentioned, he's already gotten 13 suspensions and fines in seven seasons when he was with the Cincinnati Bengals before he signed with the Raiders. Two of the suspensions were for illegal hits, totaling six games. And so I understand I do not condone those actions nor his track record. But I agree with you, Drill. You said something that strikes a chord with me was that had he been playing in the 80s or 90s, all these things, all these hits that he's been doing, he would have been completely part of the norm there. And I understand that he hasn't gone the best way about it with his antics and his smiling and is waving at the crowd on his way out of the game so i understand that there is some serious red flags when it comes to that but nonetheless a season-long suspension for vontez perfect i believe is truly erratic on the nfl's portion considering the other helmet to helmet plays that have come up in this regular season where neither of those other players have gotten suspended. I look at Derek Barnett from the Eagles who had that late hit on Jamal Williams last Thursday night that had him stretch it off the field. I don't even think he got fined for that. And so I'm thinking, where's the the rules and regulations? How is the NFL going to be able to not suspend or even fine a guy like that for that late hit, but then all of a sudden strike a season-long suspension for Vontez Perfect? And then that's just one part of my argument, Jarrell. And I won't go into the to full detail, but I think you and I both know that there's been some other players that have had a track record of domestic violence, okay, that haven't had a season-long suspension and are still getting second chances in the NFL today. So when you compare both circumstances, Vontez Burfix being an on-field action and other players being an off-the-field action, I just don't think it's justifiable. Absolutely, uh, Isaac. I, I would just agree with you um, in the sense that the NFL handles situations completely different, and the and it's really a sliding scale when it comes to every situation. Um, you know, when it comes to a person's uh, personality, um, you know, that the that the NFL deems unworthy, um, they will seem to come down in a more harsh way than guys that 
can potentially bring money and revenue to the NFL as a brand. Um, you know, when you have a guy like Tariq Hill, you have a guy like Kareem Hunt, these guys score multiple, two, you know, multiple touchdowns every year. Um, they're going to have opportunity to be um, in Pro Bowls um, for a very long time, given their uh, their talent and their, you know, and their ability to to you know to score touchdowns. And so, um, when you have situations like that, and you also have you know NFL executives, um, you know, having DUIs, you have you know owners of teams soliciting um, for their own uh, for their own benefit, and then you have you know other owners and and executives having things done within the organization that is that's definitely un you know, not deemed worthy and not having them, um, you know, have the proper, you know, the proper uh, punishment come down on them. You'll see a two, three game suspension when there are situations where, you know, people's lives are extinct, you know, having a, having a general manager driving, you know, under, under the influence, you know, having a, a, a coach um, doing cocaine before, you know, giving the team speeches is, is well out of, it's well out of line, but these guys still have opportunities at, at their careers. And um, when you see a guy that just continues to play hard, but necessarily doesn't want to uh, fall to the rules of the NFL, um, you know, uh, being put on the, the shelf and trying to basically uh, being uh, blackballed in a sense, I definitely don't think it's a, a great situation. I feel like there's all kinds of flaws when it comes to the NFL and their discipline. And this is not the first mishap, but I think there's been plenty other incidents that the NFL has mishandled and, I just don't think it's right, you know, to uh, put a player out for the entire season. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here condoning what he does, and I do believe that maybe there is some some malicious acts to some of these hits that he's put on players, but nonetheless, it is a football play. And as I mentioned as part of my supporting argument was there's players that have had issues with domestic violence and other incidents that are far more serious and yet again they're in the league and they're having the chance to play so both of us are in agreement that that season-long suspension was a little bit overdone on the NFL's standpoint but we'll now move on to the next fact or fiction statement and this one is a little bit of a surprise because I don't think either of us were expecting to be talking about this team or head coach in this regard but here it is Falcons head coach Dan Quinn deserves to be on the hot seat after an underwhelming one and three start. Is that a fact or a fiction? I would have to say it's a fact, Isaac. Um, When you look at this team's performance over the first four games, it's been extremely underwhelming. Um, They're 22nd in defense, you know, and and points per game. They're giving up 25 points per game. Um, they're, They're 25th in sacks. They only have five sacks throughout four games. Um, and they're all, and they've only had the, their their hands on the ball twice. Um, and you know, having a defensive minded coach and Dan Quinn, and you having your defense can you know contribute this type of performance. I think that he definitely deserves to be on the hot seat. You know, um, but also on the offensive end, you know, they're trying to make Matt Ryan be uh, be a Tom Brady, and he's just not that type of player. He's just not that type of guy. You know, when you have you have opportunities to have a, a, a great balance. You know, Matt Ryan can give you, you know, some phenomenal, phenomenal games. When they have their, when they, uh, when they went to the Super Bowl, they were averaging over 115 yards a game. You know, Devontae Freeman and, and uh, Terrence Coleman, they, they were, I mean, they were doing, they were doing what they needed to do in order for that offense to be successful. And there was a proper balance there. This team now is averaging under 70 yards per game rushing, and they're trying to put the, the ball in the hands of Matt Ryan. And, you know, he's continuously making mistakes in, in crucial situations. And so I think this uh, this team definitely needs to, to look themselves in the mirror and, uh, and Coach Quinn needs to look himself in the mirror as well. And um, because he has the ability to lead these guys to a successful season, but they're going to have to turn it around and, and they're going to have to turn it around defensively and running the football. I say fact as well. I did not see a 1-3 and three start coming from a talented Falcons team. And not even after that opening day no-show in Minneapolis in which they got crushed 28-12. to They bounced back by beating an injury-plagued Eagles team on Sunday Night Football 24-20. But since then, they dropped their last two games to Indianapolis 27-24 and Tennessee at home 24-10. And the stats... 
They might not look completely awful, as you mentioned. They are 10th in the NFL in yards, 9th in yards allowed, but they are misleading because they have been outscored, Jarrell, 65-10 to in the first halves of their three losses this season. So their opposition really hasn't had to risk much in the second half due to their big leads. And how about this stat? The Falcons are 19-20. and since winning the NFC title in January of 2017, and they're 8 and 12 over the past two seasons. They're now alone in last place in the NFC South. And so I do believe that Dan Quinn deserves to be on the hot seat considering all the talent he has surrounding him. He's a defensive minded head coach, but yet it falls on his shoulders for not getting the right coordinators in place. And I do believe that there is starting to be a little bit momentum growing towards the Falcons making a head coaching change in the near future if things don't turn around. Yes, sir. I do believe that they're going to have to make some changes uh, if this if this continues to happen. Um, you know, they they just extended him and they just extended the general manager, so they're going to be in a tough position to eat that money up if they have to make a, a sudden change um, towards the end of the season. But I think the Falcons are – in a position to be able to bounce back from this, they have the pieces in place. We're not looking at a debacle last year where there was just injuries all over the place. Now, there's guys available for them to be able to contribute. There's familiar faces in um, in that organization that's, that's had success before. Uh, offensively, they have to figure out a way to get Devontae Freeman going. Like He needs to average 18 to 20 carries a game to be able to give this offense a balance, and, and as well as – um, defensively, they have to create some turnovers, man, and they have to get to the quarterback. Um, their their pass rushing uh, attack isn't, you know, um, they, the guys aren't really, uh, I would have to say they're not really as fearful of these guys up front in which they have been in the past. And so Atlanta is definitely going to have to turn it around. All right, let's go to the next statement here. We're going to stay in the NFC. We're going to talk about your boy who you went to college with, and we talked a little bit about him last week and his struggles. Kirk Cousins put another dud performance out there. Now, granted, it wasn't all on him. He struggled as far as just running for his life. That Bears defensive front was in his face the entire game. But here's a statement, Jarrell. Kirk Cousins' ineffective play against winning teams will keep Minnesota out of the playoff picture in a competitive NFC this season. I'll go ahead and give my take first, and I'll toss it to you. I'll say fact on my end. Cousins and the Vikings are 2-2 two and two this year, and they're 10-9-1 since signing Cousins to that three-year, fully guaranteed $84 million deal in the offseason. We know Minnesota, they lost 16-6 to on Sunday against the Bears. And Cousins is now 4-27 against opponents with winning records. That is just absolutely atrocious. And as I said, it's not all on him because, I mean, there's pressure in his face consistently. But when you're getting paid that much money and being a quarterback in the NFL, that's what it comes with. You have to shoulder the blame, and he is simply not getting the job done. Cousins has completed a grand total of 23 passes for 272 yards in both of their wins this season because Dalvin Cook has been running the ball very effectively. But when it comes to facing high-quality opponents, Cousins has just not been there. His passer rating in wins is 122.0, and it's 73.4 in the two losses this season, Jarrell. So I just believe that Kirk Cousins and his inability to show up and show out on the biggest stages is going to keep Minnesota from getting into the playoffs this season despite their strong defense. I would have to agree with you, Isaac. Unfortunately uh, for my boy Kirk, he he definitely hasn't been living up to the to the contract that he received a couple years ago. Um, let's take a look at some stats here. When Case Keenum was the quarterback when they in 2017, they averaged 23 uh, points per game. Uh, they had th- over 350 yards per game as a, as a total offense. They were their 11th ranked offense. Um, right now, they're the 31st offense in passing. They've only had two plays uh, of plus 40 yards, and their average passer rating is 88.6. And so their defense is ranked sixth in the league, man, and they're continuing to make strides defensively. But Kirk Cousins' inability to make the throws down the field, um, you know, whether it's timing or whether it's reading coverages or having 
the opportunity to uh, make plays with his feet. It's just have it hasn't been working out for him. I think uh, this de- this defense and this offense has given this team some confidence. But, uh, you know, Kurt's going to have to make some changes on his end and we're going to have to get in the film room and figure out which ways we're going to have to to work in order for this team to be successful. They have, you know, continued playmakers on the outside. They have guys that's been in in, in uh, crucial situations in order for this team to make plays. I mean, that's in order for this team to make plays. And so Kurt's going to have to to pick it up on his end. Only having two plays over 40 yards and over, you know, with having – with having four games already, I think that that's definitely underwhelming. And so he's going to have to, uh, you know, look himself in the mirror, just like the Atlanta Falcons. And they're going to have to figure out a way to get it together, man, because there's opportunities for this team to, to push forward in, in this division, as well as in this conference. They have way too much talent out there with Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs and a rebuilt, rekindled offensive line and Dalvin Cook. They have way too much on that team for it to go to waste. So Kirk Cousins definitely needs to increase his play. And they need answers in Minnesota, and they need it fast because I could tell that their fan base is starting to get very impatient with Kirk Cousins. So we'll go to the final statement of the Fact Fiction segment this week, and it goes to the AFC South. Gardner Minshew, the talk of the NFL the last couple of weeks. So here is the statement. The Jaguars should be considered the favorites in the AFC South with the emergence of Gardner Minshew and their stout defense. Fact or fiction? I would have to say fact. When I look at their schedule uh, down the stretch, they have tough games when it comes to the Saints and the Texans. Um, but they have those guys at home. They have a uh, they have the Colts after coming off a Week Ten bye. They also have the Buccaneers and Chargers at home. Those are all winnable games I see for this team. Gardner Minshew's given them the opportunity to be able to have the ball late in uh, late in the game and make some plays with his feet, whether it's down the field running or whether it's a pump fake and um, he's scrambling for a first down. But the rushing attack—I mean, the rushing attack of this offense—is what really gives me the confidence that this team can really go far. Being able to control the ball in and, and, and crucial situations, especially against teams like the Texans, teams like the Saints and Buccaneers and Chargers, who can put points on the board, that running game is going to be uh, extremely important for this team in, in order for this team to be successful. But, you know, having all these tough teams at home, as well as having a week 10 bye that's late in the year where you can have an opportunity to, to get your legs back before going on a road to a divisional opponent. I think that it's going to play a, a very important role for this Jags team. Uh, their defense is, is is sitting kind of average for me right now. They're going to have to continue to, to make improvements in order for me to start believing in them. Um, I just think that, you know, they've been having too many holes defensively uh, through the first four games with guys that they've had success with in the past. But if they can pick some things up on, on the defensive end and, and turn – one in uh, one of those games that they had against Tennessee a few weeks ago into a reoccurring thing, then I think that this team can disguise the limit for this team. I'm going to say fiction. I agree with all the points you said, but I think at this point I have more confidence in the Indianapolis Colts and what they can do. I know they're coming off a disappointing loss to the Oakland Raiders in which I thought for sure they were going to be able to pull that one out. But when you look at their team, They have battled injuries, as every other team has, right? So that cannot be a sole excuse for Indianapolis. But they're down Darius Leonard, their best defender with concussion for the second consecutive week. T.Y. Elton has been sidelined with the quad. And then Malik Hooker, who suffered a torn meniscus a couple of weeks ago, was playing the best football of his young career. And so I still believe in Jacoby Brissett. He's thrown for 911 yards, 10 touchdowns, 2 interceptions, 65.2 completion percentage. And when you talked about Jacksonville's ability to run the football, well, Indianapolis can do that as well with their stout offensive line led by Quentin Nelson, Anthony Costanzo, and their ability to win at the point of attack to go with Marlon Mack and Naheem Hines. And, of course, don't forget that two tight end set with Eric Ebron and Jack Doyle. So I do believe that Frank Reich will get this Indianapolis team back on track once they get some of these key players back. And I still think at this point, while I still think Houston has some life in them, and this division is anybody's at this point, everybody's 2-2, two and two, including the Tennessee Titans, I just would ride with the Colts over the Jaguars at this time. 
Man, you make some compelling arguments. I think the only thing that would be the difference maker for me is having already beaten the Texans, um, you having them at home again, uh, having been going to Indianapolis after a bye week, you basically having two weeks to prepare for a team and also getting Indianapolis at home in week 17. I think that is very important for this uh, for this division. And, you know, the Jaguars are, are, are definitely riding high right now. And so I think this defense is going to find ways to continue to improve. And there's going to be opportunities for Minshew to lead this team uh, down the stretch. And if there's any opportunity for for Nick Foles to come back and kind of get into the fold, you know how he always likes to show up in the in the nick of time for the yeah. team to be successful. So, you know, you never know what this team is capable of, man. Once you get uh, a couple wins under your belt, um, especially with this Saints game approaching, if they have opportunity to, to squeak this out and win that game, I think it's definitely going to boast well for their confidence level. And so this team is going to be scary coming down the stretch, man, if they can uh, put a few wins together. That's for sure. There's a lot of intrigue there in Jacksonville, including the whole Jalen Ramsey hoopla and whether he's going to be traded or not. So we'll see how that goes on. But let's go ahead and get into some of these games, Jarrell, and we'll go by them pretty quickly because we do want to get to some of those fan questions that were submitted last night. So plenty to discuss here, but it starts on Thursday night. The Rams at the Seahawks. Both teams are 3-1. and one. A pair of NFC West foes are going to kick off in the Pacific Northwest at 8.20 p.m. Eastern time. The Rams are coming off a surprising 55-40 to 40 loss to the Bucks in Jameis Winston. And Seattle, on the other hand, beat the Cardinals 27-10 to 10 in dominant fashion in Arizona. So now they're returning home to CenturyLink. Who do you have winning this game, Jarrell, and why? I have the Rams coming up to Seattle and getting a, a, a win and a shootout. Uh, over the last couple years, They each team has averaged over 30 points per game in this matchup. Uh, I don't think it's going to be any different in this, in this matchup upcoming. Um, I think that Jared Goff is – Going to be throwing the ball a lot as he threw for over 60 times, uh, 60 attempts last week. Uh, I think that him, him limiting turnovers is going to be the key in order for them to be successful. But also Ty Gurley, if he if they can get him to 15, you know, 18 touches some way, somehow, I think this team is going to have an opportunity to be successful. And I think their defense is going to find they're going to uh, they're going to have an opportunity to make some plays. I know Russell Wilson doesn't make a lot of mistakes, but. They're going to get back on track. Big time game, division game. Aaron Donald comes out to dominate, and I and I don't see anybody on the Seattle's offensive line that has has an ability to stop him. So, I have the Rams winning this one, thirty-seven to thirty-four. Okay, I'm going to oppose you on this one. I'm going to take the home team, the Seattle Seahawks, for the very reason of the Rams and their inability to get their rushing attack going. The Rams this season they are ranked twenty-second. Averaging 99.8 yards on the ground. Todd Gurley has been abysmal to say the least. 219 yards on 49 carries. Of course, he's got a 4.5 yards per carry average and three touchdowns. But his best performance came in week one against Carolina when he rushed for 97 yards. But since then, Jarrell, week two, 16 carries, 63 yards and a touchdown. Week three, 14 carries, 43 yards. And then week four, five carries for 16 yards. And I know they've been without Austin Blythe, their starting offensive guard, but they're going to face a very tough Seattle front seven. Jadavion Clowney, Ziggy Ansah, Puna Ford, and then K.J. Wright, Bobby Wagner. I think this Seattle defense will be the difference. I I can see situations where Jared Goff's going to be going to the air quite a bit because they are going to be unable to get Todd Gurley going on the ground. But Russell Wilson at home... He is playing at a superb level right now, and he's not getting a lot of talk, and it's kind of crazy and baffling because he's putting together an MVP season for the Seattle Seahawks. I think he gets the job done, connects with his boy Tyler Lockett and a couple of long touchdown strikes, and this Ram secondary is banged up as well. Taylor Rapp and then Marcus Peters, who's in concussion protocol, so his availability is still up in the air. Give me the Seahawks 27-23. to in a close one, but I give the home team the slight advantage in this one. We have uh, we differ on that, man, but it's going to be an exciting game. As I said, the last couple of years has been over 30 points per game, 
in each of the last uh, couple of matchups. So uh, I'm excited to see what these offenses can do. Um, but I'm also see, excited to see what these defense alignment can do, man. There's great pass rushers on both sides of the ball, so it's, we'll see what happens. All right, now let's go on to the rest of Week 5's matchups. We'll roll on here pretty quickly. So the Jaguars at the Carolina Panthers. Both teams are 2-2. Two and two. Kyle Allen, Gardner Minshew. Who would have thought we were going to see this quarterback matchup? I'm going to roll with the Panthers, 20-17. to 17. I think Kyle Allen's got some things going, and Christian McCaffrey is sensational in his ability to light up defenses. I'm taking Carolina by three. Man, I have the Panthers going 24-13. Uh, to 13. Um, They have the number one ranked passing defense. I think they're going to make um, the day hard for Gardner Minshew. Um, but Kyle Allen, man, 3-0, and um, six touchdowns, no interceptions. Man, he's having the Panthers team uh, feeling themselves. And uh, obviously, Christian McCaffrey doing his thing week in and week out. He's starting to look like the Reggie Bush of the NFL. And so, at the end of the day, man, it's going to be exciting to see. I have the Panthers 24-13. Patriots 4-0 on the road to the nation's capital to take on the 0-4 Redskins. Man, it's been a brutal season for Washington up to this point. Jay Gruden has yet to name a starter. It could be Dwayne Haskins. It could be Keenum. It could be Colt McCoy, who's coming back from injury. Give me the Patriots in a beatdown, 30-10. to 10. New England, those guys are just playing at an unbelievable level, and it's not surprising. Bill Belichick has that team firing on all cylinders. Too much for Washington and a team that has been through some turmoil early in this season. Pat, 30-10. to 10. We would have to agree on that. I, I, I'm slightly off as far as the prediction score. I have the Pats winning 30 to seven. Um, I think that Dwayne Haskins definitely needs to be the quarterback. I mean, if you want to see what a quarter, what a guy wants uh, has to do, um, you have to put him out there. But I didn't think last week was the best opportunity. I think you give him a full week of preparation. Uh, but the Patriots are firing on all cylinders, being the number one uh, defense in points per game. So, 30 to seven Pats. Here's a good matchup right here, Jarrell. The Bills three and one. At the Titans, 2-2, two and two. this is an AFC clash that could have some playoff implications down the road as far as the wild card picture. I have the Titans winning a very close game, 24-20 to 20 at home. The Bills, they almost took down the Patriots. Unfortunately, they lost Josh Allen to that concussion late in the game, and Matt Barkley was forced into the ball game. But right now, the Titans, they're kind of up and down. One week, they look like contenders, and next week, they're flat. Obviously, last week coming off a big win in Atlanta. I think Marcus Mariota continues his hot streak. This defense pass rush with Cam Wake and Harold Landry come to life. Give me the Titans, 24-20. to 20. See, that's where I'm going to have to disagree. I got the Bills coming in winning 18-10. to 10. I think it's going to be a slugfest um, defensively. Uh, we, des- we definitely don't know what Josh Allen is going to do, having been in concussion protocol. But my man Frank Gore moving into fourth all time on the Russian list, having an opportunity to continue to uh, bolster his career and his stats. I think they're going to be trying to uh, uh, obviously spoon feed him every 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 which way, man. They're going to give him an opportunity to touch the football. Um, The second best defense in the league, man. I have the Bills on the road, 18 to 10, uh, shutting down A.J. Brown and uh, this Mariota offense. To the AFC North we go. The 2-2 two two Ravens taking on the 1-3 and three Steelers. The Steelers finally getting their first win on Monday night against a very atrocious Bengals team that put, I think, the entire nation to sleep. That game was very boring. But now we're uh, in Pittsburgh. This is a big game for the Steelers because they know a win can get them tied atop that division. I don't see it happening personally. I think Baltimore, they're going to come back angry. They're going to bounce back. 27-17, Lamar Jackson. I feel like he's going to dice up Pittsburgh secondary that has been very weak at times, although Minka Fitzpatrick is there and he's been able to play at a good level there. I just think Baltimore is a more complete team, so I give him a 10-point victory on the road. I, too, have uh, Baltimore winning 27-17. I think they got embarrassed last week. You know, obviously the absence of Brandon Williams in the middle, uh, having uh, a big guy like that to be able to fill the void uh, was was very was a, was crucial last week for this for the Browns and their success on the ground with Nick Chubb. And so uh, I think Lamar Jackson is going to have to start throwing for some touchdowns. He's been running for some, and, and you know, obviously they've been doing good on the ground rushing. But I think that the, the Steelers have a, a, a very tough matchup coming with Baltimore, and I think Baltimore gets back on track, twenty-seven to seventeen. 
A matchup of winless teams. The Cardinals 0-3-1 going to Cincinnati to take on the 0-4 Bengals. I have Arizona winning 28-21. Kyler Murray, this is the game where I think he's going to pass for four touchdowns against that Bengals secondary that looks clueless week in and week out. Man, I don't know if I've seen an NFL team have as many blown coverages as the Bengals. Look for the Cardinals to get their first victory for Cliff Kingsbury and for Kyler Murray to have a big day through the air. Yeah, it's time for Kyler Murray to really showcase his skills. I think this is going to be like a seven-on-seven type of ordeal. <laughs> and um, so I definitely have the Cardinals coming in winning 21-13. to set, uh, 13. I think that Kyler Murray is going to light it up offensively as far as the yards. Um, hopefully, Larry Fitzgerald has an opportunity to go over 100 yards against this defense, man. And so it'll be a phenomenal to see. And so I have the Cards winning 21-13. to 13. Now a game that could put some pressure, as we've already talked about, Dan Quinn, but Bill O'Brien, he's got a lot of people in that Texans organization and fan base starting to question his play calling and their slow start considering the talent they have. So this game could have some implications as far as head coaches and maybe the loss of a job. So the 1-3 and three Falcons going to Texas, taking on the Texans who are 2-2. Two and two. This is going to be a very close game, and I had a tough time picking a winner, but I'm going to give it to the Falcons. Just under pure desperation they're one in three they understand the circumstances that the saints are running away with this division the panthers and the bucks are playing some good ball as well i think atlanta finds ways to move the ball offensively get julio jones involved early after a dud performance in week four give me the falcons 26 23 over the texans I would have to disagree with you. I have the Texans winning 24 to 20. I think Deshaun Watson is going to be uh, just what it, with, with the Texans need in order for them to be successful. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, uh, I think he's going to be a, have a phenomenal game. Um, their, their defense, man, is just really terrible. And I just think uh, Atlanta is not going to be able to, to keep up with the scoring. Uh, you know, they're going to have some turnovers when it comes to, you know, J.J. Watt and, and against Matt Ryan. I think that it's going to be phenomenal to see. So I have the Texans winning 24 to 20. All right. Vikings at the Giants. Both teams at two and two. Vikings yet again taking a road trip. The Giants, Daniel Jones, no Saquon Barkley again this week. I have the Vikings pulling out a very low scoring game, 19 to 14 over the Giants. This is a performance where I can see Minnesota's defense scoring on a pick six or a fumble return for a touchdown. I think they're going to make life very hard on Daniel Jones. They'll try to shut down the run game entirely with Wayne Goldman there, and they're going to force Daniel Jones into a couple of turnovers. So give me the Vikes, 19-14. I, too, have the Vikes winning. I have them winning 24-18. to 18. I think that this is the game that Kirk Cousins have an opportunity to get back on track. Uh, you, you're going against a Giants team that, you know, obviously is playing with a little bit more sense of desperation, um, you know, behind Daniel Jones. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think that they have the opportunity to keep up with this Vikings team offensively or defensively. And so I think that this is the, this is the chance that Kirk Cousins finds his confidence. He finds confidence in the offense and the passing game. And I have them winning 24-18. to All right. Bears at Raiders. This is a revenge game for Khalil Mack. He's even said it himself. He's looking forward to taking on his old team. This is going to be a field goal affair, Jarrell. I don't know if there's going to be very much offense, especially Mitch Trubisky. Unlikely to play, although Chase Daniel actually looked pretty darn good. I just don't see a whole ton of fireworks. So give me the Bears 16 to 13 in a very low scoring game. And Khalil Mack, I think he's going to put together a dominant performance with a couple of sacks, a couple of turnovers on Derek Carr, who's been a little bit hesitant inside the pocket. That's the difference. Chicago by three, 16 13. Man, you're not giving my man Chase Daniel enough credit, man. I think Chase Daniel's a phenomenal quarterback. Every time he's had opportunity to go out there, uh, he's produced uh, well over 200 yards passing. He's had opportunities uh, to score touchdowns and and leading off and leading the team. Um, you know, with his height, everything, everybody kind of judges that. But he has the ability to put points on the board. He comes from an Andy Reid scheme. He knows the entire offense front and back. So Matt Nagy will definitely not have to drop off when it comes to play calling or anything uh, scheme wise. Uh, so I actually have the Bears winning 24 to nine. I think that Khalil Mack is going to come out and dominate. I have him written down for four sacks. 
and looking literally John Gruden and, and all those guys right in the face, uh, letting them know that what they could have had uh, moving forward to that Las Vegas stadium. And so I think the Bears are going to win 24 to 9. On we go to the 0-3 Jets, taking on the 2-2 Philadelphia Eagles in the city of brotherly love. The Jets coming off their bye week. It's been ugly for them. They're hoping to get Sam Darnold back in the lineup, who's missed the last couple of weeks with Mono. I honestly don't think it matters whether Darnold plays or not. I think the Eagles are going to win this game. Carson Wentz has looked very sharp. A lot of people have been questioning his durability. But that offensive line, Jarrell, they really turned some heads against Green Bay in the dominant performance they had, opening up gaping holes for Jordan Howard. I look for them to do the same against the New York Jets front. That's probably going to be without Quinnen Williams again, and C.J. Mosley is not looking likely to play either. So two big losses yet again for Adam Gase's side. Eagles 27-13. I have the winning. I have the Eagles winning twenty-eight to three. I think they're going to dominate this Jets offense. Uh, we just haven't seen enough from them offensively week in and week out to give them to give me any confidence that they're going to make any type of strides. Um, even with Sam Darnold having the possibility of returning, I think the Eagles are going to dominate them. They're starting to feel themselves a little bit. Um, anytime you have a chance to go into Green Bay and you win against a, a, a Aaron Rodgers and the, the way this offense has been playing. You, you're, you're definitely going to be feeling yourself coming into the next week. And so I think the Eagles have opportunity at home to dominate 28-3. to Next matchup here, the 0-4 Broncos at the 2-2 two two Chargers. Who do you have taking this one? Uh, I have Chargers 30-13. to uh, Bradley Chubb being out hurts the Broncos' defense even more. And uh, they haven't had the opportunity to stop anybody defensively this year under Big Benji. So I have the Chargers 30 to 13. Yes, I have the Chargers as well. Unfortunate. Bradley Chubb done for the season with a partially torn ACL. The Chargers, they understand that in order to even stay within reach of the Chiefs in that AFC West, they need a stack wins. They're dealing with a lot of injuries, but I still like them to get the job done. 31 20 over Denver. On we go to the next one. This is a big one. America's Game of the Week, 425 <laughs> p.m. Eastern Time. The Dallas Cowboys taking on the Green Bay Packers in Arlington, Texas. Jarrell, I already know who you're going with, but I want to hear your reasoning <laughs> so I can disagree with you. So go ahead and give me why the Cheeseheads are going to win. Man, I got the Cheeseheads because I got Aaron Rodgers. I got his dominance over Dallas. Uh, his ability to push the ball down the field. I think that uh, the Saints opened up the formula last week into stopping this Dallas offense, and I think that the Green Bay Packers are definitely going to try to mimic the same things this week. Uh, I think that they're going to have opportunity to come back and 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 get right back on track after you know uh, having a disappointing uh, loss last week to Philadelphia. So I have Aaron Rodgers, man, coming through big time. Um, he threw that interception in the red zone last week. It, it hurt that offense and their and their chances to win. And so I'm telling you, he's got a big chip on his shoulder this week, and I look for him to put up at least 400 yards passing against this Dallas Dallas defense. What's the score line? What's the score? Man, I, I have him 34 to 28 in the shootout. No, man, I'm going to roll with the Dallas Cowboys. I understand Aaron Rodgers has been the sheriff in Dallas, Texas, the last, what, three or four years, he's gone into AT&T Stadium and he has taken the hearts out of the Dallas Cowboys faithful time and time again. I look for this matchup to be another nail-biter for both sides. It's going to be a very entertaining game, but I think the Cowboys will find a way to win, and I think it's because of their run game that they're going to be able to establish and dominate time of possession. The Saints completely shut down Ezekiel Elliott in that rushing attack. And so credit to them. But we all saw Green Bay's rush defense and how awful they were against Philadelphia. And I look for this Cowboys offense to expose that, which is going to open up play action passing for Dak Prescott. And give me the Cowboys 27-24 to with a game-winning field goal off the leg of Brett Maher. So the Cowboys return the favor of a ruthless field goal victory over those Green Bay Packers, but it definitely is going to be a fun one to watch. Absolutely, man. I'm definitely, I definitely have my popcorn ready for this one. I'm going to be right at the TV, have an opportunity to watch it. I think that Aaron Rodgers and this team is going to light it up. 
as well as that Prescott and, and Zeke, man, I think they're going to uh, have opportunities to, to score a lot of points as well. So it's going to be a great game to see, bro. I'm sure you and I are going to have some fun exchanges throughout the game. So looking forward to that, man. But we got two more games on the slate. Primetime games, Colts at the Chiefs, Indianapolis 2-2, two two. Patrick Mahomes and that Chiefs team, they're rolling 4-0. and oh. This is a Sunday night showdown. The Chiefs are way too much at this point, especially they're at Arrowhead and Indianapolis. As I mentioned earlier, they're still dealing with some injuries to that defense. Malik Hooker is going to be a big loss for them if he doesn't play considering the, the vertical attack that Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes use, I think they take it 34-23 to 23 over Indianapolis. I have the Chiefs winning big, 33-20. Um, to 20. I think that they're just going to be too much. They, they kind of uh, got their, their selves tested last week with their visit to Detroit, but they had an opportunity to win that game and on, uh, um, on an extraordinary play with Travis Kelsey and Shady McCoy. And so, I think that they're going to have a, a big confidence coming into this week. And, you know, obviously with the injuries that Indianapolis is dealing with, I think there's going to be too much. So the Chiefs 33-20. to 20. And the final game of week number five, it's Monday night. We got the Browns 2-2 two and two going to San Francisco to take on the unbeaten 49ers in Kyle Shanahan's squad. They're 3-0 coming off that bye I have the Niners winning this one, Jarrell. This this Niners defense, they are no joke. DeForest Buckner, Eric Armstead, Quan Alexander, Richard Sherman playing at a high level as well. I think this front seven, they're going to get after a Browns offensive line that's already shown some of their flaws early in this season. I know Nick Chubb's coming off a big-time performance, but look for those lanes to be closed going up against a daunting defensive front who I haven't even mentioned, Nick Bosa, who's also a very big-time athletic coming off the edge. So give me the Niners taking this one by a score of 26-17 to 17 over the Browns. Ah, you got the Niners staying undefeated. I, I think that the Browns are going to come in and have an opportunity to win this game, man. I think that, you know, with them getting over the hump last week with their division foe, uh, playing against a phenomenal defense on the road and uh, showcasing what they did offensively. I think that Baker Mayfield is going to find a way to figure it out. They have too many weapons offensively in order for this defense to stop them And as far as the pass coverage is concerned. Um, Richard Sherman can't guard, you know, both OBJ and both Jarvis Landry, um, and he was able to get rolling last week. So um, I, have the, I have the Browns uh, in prime time um, going out there winning 31-24. to 24. All right, so that does it. Now, as promised, we have a couple of questions that were asked by some listeners that we're going to get to before we close out today's episode. And so we'll go ahead and give quick answers to these so we can uh, get through these. But Sam wants to know, do you guys think that the Giants are legit following their last two victories? So, Drew, I'll let you uh, answer that one first, and I'll give my answer. I don't think that the Giants are legit this year. I think that they're playing with an awesome amount of pride. I think that they believe in Daniel Jones a lot. And anytime you have an opportunity to ch change things up in the organization for the betterment of the team, and it's always going to give guys a lot of confidence um, week in and week out. I just don't think that they have the personnel to be able to contend with the rest of the NFL on a week to week on a week to week basis. And um, I just think that the Giants are playing on a very extreme high right now. Uh, but as teams start to get more film on Daniel Jones, it's going to become tougher for the for the for them to score points. And so, I just think the Giants are are definitely just riding it high at the moment. I agree with that. I don't think they're legit yet. I do think that there's bright future ahead with them with Daniel Jones there. They're two and two. They lost to the Cowboys and Buffalo Bills with Eli Manning, and then since they made that change to Daniel Jones, they had that big epic comeback against Tampa Bay, and then. Just completely steamrolled the Redskins, excuse me, 24-23. But their schedule, Jarrell, four of their next five games, they have to play the Vikings, the Patriots, the Lions, and the Cowboys. So tough schedule. Their defense is still very leaky. They rank 25th in total defense. That secondary is too big of a liability. So they're not legit this season, but they will be in the coming years. So how about this one? This is a very interesting question, and I think it's uh, worth putting some attention to it, Jarrell. Michael Santiago wants to know, do we think Jameis Winston can go to the Pro Bowl this season? Absolutely. I think that the, he has an opportunity to do great things under the, the arm of Bruce Arians. Um, he's finally starting to find his groove. 
the display that he put on last week uh, versus the Rams and, you know, being on the road against that, that pass rush that's known to get after quarterbacks and as well as the Rams having both of their starting uh, corners in the game. Um, you know, Tlaib had a, had a terrible game last week and he's known for being the physical guy last week and, and uh, Marcus Peters as well. And now he's in concussion protocol, but what they've been able to do offensively, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And so I think that he's, he's he has to limit his turnovers. If he, if his uh, turn t- touchdown to, in, to t- uh, interception ratio can uh, change, then he, he definitely has the opportunity to make the pro bowl. I agree with that. I do believe Winston can get there as well. As you mentioned, coming off that big time performance, 28 of 41 for 385, four touchdowns to one interception against that stingy Rams defense. Now you look at him overall, Jarrell, fifth in pass yards with 1,167 yards, nine touchdowns. Of course, the interceptions have been his Achilles heel. He's got five this season, 62.6 completion percentage. Bruce Arians clearly is pressing the right buttons and Byron Leftwich, who's the offensive coordinator. So I do think Winston is very capable of getting into the Pro Bowl and taking this Tampa Bay Bucks team to who knows how far, but they do have the talent. They could be a sneaky team as playoffs come later into the year. Now for the final question, which I really think is a pretty good question uh, to get us thinking a little bit, Jarrell. Andy wants to know, outside of Patrick Mahomes, which young quarterback would you most want to build a team around? That's a tough one. Uh, there's a, a few good quarterbacks that I, I really think that are, are coming a long way. Um, number one being Lamar Jackson, uh, as well as Jared Goff. I think that the system that they have in L.A. is is really giving them confident, confidence in, in order to make plays. I think that he has to limit his turnover uh, ratio as well and I think that he has to improve um, in tough situations against third and long and, and and big pressure situations but I like Lamar Jackson I love what he's been able to do with this Baltimore offense and the confidence that they've been able to play with and but he has to be able to score score touchdowns through the air and not just with his feet if he has opportunity to collect uh, touchdowns through the air just as well as he is on the ground and uh, Baltimore has a great opportunity to, to uh, have the quarterback of the future. And I think that um, he is the he is definitely the guy that I, I'm, I'm very interested to keep an eye on over the next couple seasons. For me, the young quarterback that I'd most want to build around, of course, not considering Mahomes, is Deshaun Watson from the Texans. I know he struggled at times getting rid of the ball, taking too many sacks, but Houston's offensive line has not done him any favors and he's uh, gotten out to a little bit of a slow start. He put together some strong first couple seasons in the league. His football IQ is off the charts. And one thing with Deshaun Watson is he's just a pure winner. He did it at Clemson, knocked off Alabama in the national championship. And he has a, a good way of leading his team. You can tell the whole locker room buys into his vision and his direction. And he's got a very strong arm. He can make plays down the field. Of course, he needs to improve his accuracy. He missed on a couple of long balls last week, which did uh, result into their loss. But nonetheless, I do like Watson's upside, and I think he's only going to continue to develop into one of the best young quarterbacks in the NFL. Yes, he has phenomenal talent. His IQ is definitely off the charts. Um, You know, obviously it was displayed a couple uh, couple days ago in his interview, his post-game interview. And he's a he's a bright young man. He has opportunity to go very far. I think the Texans have to do him the justice of spending spending the money up front in order for him uh, to have continued success. But uh, but as long as him and DeAndre Hopkins have opportunity to be on the same team together, then uh, this team is going to go far. So there you have it. That's the end of this week's podcast. We got to some fan questions, broke down the matchups, and did some fact fiction for y'all. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll be right back next Wednesday to recap week five, preview week six. Again, Jarrell, thanks for taking the time to join me. Looking forward to watching some excellent, exciting football games. Absolutely, man. It's going to be a great weekend for some football, college football. We take on Ohio State, being that is in Michigan State. So go green. I'm very excited for my boys up there in East Lansing, as well as uh, the Cheeseheads going against Dallas this weekend, man. So uh, come on, go, man. Yeah, you come know what I'm on. saying? Go, 
go green all the way, whether it's NFL or, or whether it's college football, man. So I'm excited to see my guys uh, compete this week. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'll definitely be watching that Michigan State-Ohio State game because I'll tell you what, Jarrell, they sure took the Huskers to the woodshed and put a beating on them last week, so that was pretty ugly to watch. So we'll see if Michigan State can give them a tougher game. But, again, I appreciate your time, man, and I enjoy picking your brain as an NFL player, so I think it gives – our listeners a, a good view and understanding of what it's like coming from a player who's been around the game and all these players. So again, big thanks to you, man. Thank you again, man. And as, a, as, as always, it's a pleasure to be able to share the, the podcast with you and uh, give my take on teams and players and, and whatnot. And uh, so fans continue to keep writing your questions and uh, continue to keep asking uh, for great content because we really do appreciate it. Blessings. Take care. And we'll touch base next week. All right, bro. Take care.